everyone, and welcome to our second webinar in our spring series on skills development and assessment. We're very pleased that you're joining us today as we talk about rubric adaptation and customizing assessment tools. And we thought this Rubik's Cube is a great symbol of adapting to, uh, to your own needs, your institution's needs for rubrics. Um, before we begin, we'd like to just go over some housekeeping to echo what Tyler went into. Um, we will have a Q&A session following our panelists' presentations. This will happen um, second half of the webinar. As Tyler said, you can type your questions into the chat box um, to the all panelists. And we'll be posting both um, the slides from the webinar as well as a full recording to our website later this week. Um, so all folks who registered the webinar will get an email with that link um, as soon as it's up. So some information on HECO. Who are we? Um, HECO is an agency of the Ontario government. We were created in 2005 on the heels of Bob Ray's report, which reviewed post-secondary education in Ontario and recommended that an independent body be established to monitor the post-secondary education system in uh, Ontario and provide policy advice to government. We conduct research relating to our three priorities. The first is access. We look at improving access to higher education for underrepresented groups and providing supports to ensure that all students have a chance to succeed once there. We also look at quality, which we define in terms of learning outcomes. What do Ontario post-secondary students know and what can they do? At ECHO, we look at four types of learning outcomes, disciplinary knowledge, basic cognitive skills such as literacy and numeracy, higher order cognitive skills such as problem solving, and transferable skills such as teamwork and time management. Finally, we look at system design where we seek to answer the question of how the Ontario post-secondary system can improve on efficiency and effectiveness without compromising on access or quality. We conduct internal research, but we primarily work in partnership with Ontario's colleges and universities to conduct research relating to our three priorities. And all of our research is public and available on our website. I'd like to call upon my colleague Elise Watkins, a senior researcher here at HECO, to give a brief overview of our work in this area relating to this webinar. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Danielle. The Learning Outcomes Assessment Consortium, more affectionately known by the acronym LOAC, was established in 2012 to determine what our institutions doing to assess skills and what can the sector learn from this. To answer these questions, HECO has partnered with colleges and universities, as shown on the slide, to explore three things, the creation, the validation, and the implementation of assessment tools to capture those important higher order cognitive skills. The assessment tools used for these projects have included e-portfolios, scorecards, and of course, the subject of today's webinar, rubrics. Several of our LOAC projects have developed or are currently developing rubrics to assess skills such as critical thinking, communication, teamwork, design, problem solving, and creative, creative thinking. One of those projects is from Queen's University, which Brian Frank will discuss with you in detail today. Also, four of our LOAC projects are specifically adapting the value rubrics from the Association of American Colleges and Universities. And we will be hearing more about those rubrics from our panelist, Terrell Rhodes, shortly. And now back to Danielle to introduce our panelists. Thanks, Elise. So I'd now like to introduce our, our two esteemed panelists who will be presenting today, Terry Rhodes and Brian Frank. Terry Rhodes is Vice President for the Office of Quality Curriculum and Assessment at the Association of American Colleges and Universities, AACNDU, where he focuses on the quality of undergraduate education, access, general education, and assessment of student learning. He is also the Executive Director of the Valid Assessment of Learning and Undergraduate Education Value Initiative and Co-Director of the annual AACNDU General Education Institute. At AACNU, he is currently working on faculty-driven assessment of student learning through the establishment of a focus on authentic student work to demonstrate quality student learning. Brian Frank is the inaugural Associate Dean at Teaching and Learning in the Faculty of Engineering and Applied Science. He is one of the co-founders of the Canadian Engineering Education Association and over the past five years has coordinated the Engineering Graduate Attribute Development EGAD project to develop national guidelines and resources for outcomes assessment in engineering education. 
He is also one of the project leads on the Queen's University Learning Outcomes Assessment Consortium project that Elise just described. So first up, over to you, Terry. Great, thank you, and welcome to all of you this afternoon. I am, will be going through uh, a set of materials pretty quickly, uh, but of course we can return to those at the end with once you've had a chance to also hear from Brian. Uh, this is about the development of the value rubrics uh, that were geared toward uh, improvement, professional development, and equity. Um, the results, what we are finding is that by utilizing rubrics, we are able to actually create and reveal evidence around the quality of student learning from the, that can be utilized at the course level, at program level, institution-wide, as well as at a policy level for those agencies and, and that have various uh, oversight of higher education and also become advocates for the direction and the in the quality of learning in higher education that is ex exemplified for the public, employers, et cetera. And so I will have some slides in here that are more for your reference after the uh, webinar, but to give you a sense of, of the multiple levels in which the results from the utilization of rubrics are being used. Uh, the approach that we utilize, the what we call the value rubric approach, does have some assumptions that underlie it. And this is a list of those that learning is best examined as a process that occurs over time. And so our rubrics were indeed developed as more of a developmental guide to learning, that growth and development would be occurring. And that was indeed the point of looking at and assessing student learning. That what we ask our students to do in the curriculum, in the co-curriculum, uh, and through our assignments and the tasks that we give students and therefore the artifacts that they produce as a result of that to demonstrate their learning um, is indeed the best indication of the motivation of our students. We know that not all students are always motivated to do their best work, but when we start to look at what, we, what they are producing, we will over time get a good, good indication of the level of their motivation and the level of their accomplishments. The um, learning outcomes are indeed the most important part of this. We do not try to uh, replicate what faculty do, especially in terms of their content areas and their, their focus of expertise. That is what occurs in the grading process through the work and the assignments that faculty and interactions during an entire term. What we are looking at here are the dimensions of learning outcomes, and that learning is not a single thing. It is comprised of a variety of dimensions and criteria. And it's by looking at that mix of criteria that, that bring, are brought together to exemplify a learning outcome that we might call critical thinking is it realization that it's comprised of multiple dimensions and aspects that faculty and other educators do indeed have some expertise and, and can exercise expert judgment, not only in their content area, but also in looking at how the, rep, how the learning is represented through the assignments that we give. And even though they may not be a particular expert in written communication or oral communication or teamwork, they actually can give us some informed expert judgment about the general quality of those elements of any learning. And finally, that the whole point of engaging in what we call assessment of looking at the quality of student work uh, is because we're going to get something useful out of it that we can use in our day-to-day -day activities as educators, in our day-to-day -day interactions with our students in order to improve the learning that students are exposed to and um, engender in the work and the study that they do. If we're not getting useful, actionable results, we should be doing something other than what we're being asked to engage in. Just so everyone knows, I think most of you probably have seen rubrics before. Our value rubrics all have two basic pages to them. This is what we call the front page. This is the value rubric for critical thinking. It has a little bit of information in terms of transparency as to the teams of faculty and educators that have developed it, what they were thinking, what their definition is, uh, some framing language so that 
again, the person utilizing it can indeed see where their emphasis lie and that how they approached it, what they may have looked at in some of the literature, et cetera. And although we did pursue these rubrics as generic to be used across disciplinary contexts, um, colleges within universities, et cetera, programmatic areas, that there were, in terms of some of the rubric outcomes, language that the developers thought were critically important to the understanding of what the learning w needed to look like and what they would be keying on as indicators. And so there is a glossary for many of them. Uh, although we, d again, tried to discourage folks from using jargon that was p specific to a particular disciplinary context. The second page, or the back page of each one of the rubrics, um, is made up of three basic things. The set of criteria that I was articulating. Every rubric has a five to six dimensions or criteria, components of, of what learning looks like that comprises the outcome that's under uh, study here. In this case, it's the integrative learning rubric. It's measured through the levels that have been created. We started out with six levels when we developed these, and what we found is, is people use these on the campuses in their own courses with their own students. They said, this is too many. It's too, too fine a tuning of what this is if we're talking about it in this generic cross-cutting um, way. And so we decided to uh, narrow that to four. We didn't do five because of the sort of Re, the effort, uh, the desire, the tendency to move to the center on that and to take an, a sort of unequivocal or, or a, a equivocal um, place in the middle of it, not making a judgment. We wanted people to make a judgment here about the quality of that learning and so not to have a, a middle point that they could default to. There is a fifth part of it, which is a zero, which indicates that they're, they, you're not seeing uh, the learning that is being looked for on some of the criteria in the work that students are doing. It's not that that's bad necessarily. All it means is that it's not showing up in the student work. And that I'll come back to some reasons why that's the case. And then finally, the heart of it is the performance descriptors, the actual description of what it is people looked for in judging the quality of the learning. We start at the left-hand side of that uh, next to the criteria as what the expectation was, the desire was for students who were graduating with a baccalaureate degree and then moving to the right, i.e., we, we wanted folks to start with an assumption that students were demonstrating learning at the highest level that we, and if we didn't see it, then we would move to the right rather than starting with a, a deficit perspective of focusing on what's missing. We wanted to focus on what was actually being demonstrated in the work. So that's a real brief overview of the anatomy of the rubrics themselves. The work that we've been engaged in most recently, we've been able to move uh, beyond individual campus uh, ex experience with the rubrics to a set of projects. The multi-state that's listed here in blue is a set of 13 states in the United States that uh, their higher education office in each of those states said, we want to engage in this, we want to look at this in terms of the quality of learning in our public institutions, two- and four-year public institutions in our state. So they sampled those institutions and sampled work and pr pr submitted it for scoring using the rubrics. They all agreed to use the same rubrics and to have it scored using those. The purple is the Minnesota Collaborative. It's part of the multi-state, but they also, uh, in, their, in that state, said we also work with private institutions. And so it just represents that four-year liberal arts colleges joined the work in the state of Minnesota. The sort of orange or brown dots are the Great Lakes Colleges Association. Again, our association's membership encompasses all sectors of higher education, public and private, large, small research, community college, liberal arts colleges, military academies, faith-based institutions, et cetera. And this project is a consortium of private liberal arts colleges in the Midwest part of the United States that also joined the project. Out of the three years of institutions collaborating together around learning using the rubrics, 
we have now initiated what we're calling the Value Institute that, to try to open this option up to all campuses and all institutions to be able to collect student work around particular outcomes and be able to submit it to the institute where we have trained certified scorers using the value rubrics that will score real people scoring the work that is being produced so that they can have external validation of the work that they're seeing and engaged in locally. What I wanted to do is to show real briefly uh, a couple slides where one of the participants in this set of projects we've had going on is the state of Kentucky. And they wanted to be engaged with this in order to see how students were doing on critical thinking, qualitative literacy, quantitative literacy, and written communication. And so they had a, a sort of a scorecard, a, a dial, a dashboard kind of thing to be able to show this over time. But what it does is it illustrates uh, one of the things that we recommend and one of the things we don't recommend. Um, so that they sh started to show it over time. So there's 2015, 2016, 2017, and they're showing averages. Uh, there's an N that is indicated there, uh, as well as a average score on the particular outcome. Uh, and then they could, at the very far right, see whether or not the performance in Kentucky was how it compared with the performance in the multi-state uh, as an average. And it was over or under, over, under, over, under. And so they were pleased to see that folks in Kentucky seemed to, on average, perform better than the students in the entire project. Um, that's all fine and good. It gives a nice snapshot of a of, of way of looking at the data. We recommend that the that the averaging not be done and that it not be the key focus of the work because what it the rubric is designed to do is to allow us to actually unpack the different dimensions and aspects of of developing quality learning on each of the outcomes and when you start to average it uh, it blurs all of that and so much of the value is getting that more detailed information the um, following one looks specifically at quantitative literacy, and here is a what we think is a more useful, although from a sort of public display kind of perspective, may not be as useful as the preceding one. But again, it looks at the learning over time. It looks at different institutions that are not identified as to who they are, but it's broken out by each dimension, all six dimensions of that comprise the quantitative literacy. And so again, you can see the pattern over time, but you can also see where different dimensions, students are doing, demonstrating higher quality in other areas where they're showing less advanced quality of work. And so again, uh, at the bottom, they started to show, uh, here's the average again, it's getting better. Here's the average, it was getting worse. And here are some areas where it's sort of the same. Um, averages can be useful, but the learning outcome itself, average, then starts to mask those rich details that are exhibited when you start to look at the different dimensions independently. And that's where we can start to address things like assignments, the work that we're doing, the explications that we give students when we give them assignments to say we need to perhaps have more focus, more attention to, say, assumptions in quantitative analyses or uh, into some of the calculation or, in some instances, the applications. The, what we're learning from all of this is indeed that that broader context, that external validation is wonderfully useful for framing the picture of learning, that landscape of the learning, the strengths and the weaknesses over a larger framework of similar institutions or the province or state that one is in, uh, but that the local data are indeed critical. And that's where you can really 
effectuate changes in learning and lift up the specific things that an institution may focus on or that are central to their mission that they're emphasizing while seeing at the same time what may be lost if there's an overemphasis on specific things versus developing a broader foundation for the learning outcome you're interested in. It also allows us to deconstruct or disaggregate in terms of of the fairness and the and the equity of learning uh, are there patterns of groups or aspects of student characteristics and demographics that exhibit higher or lower patterns of learning or ex or opportunities and again what we're finding is that these are often tied to the kinds of assignments that students have been given more so than the particular demographics of the student uh, subpopulations. Um, and it also allows us to see that the learning is occurring in an interdisciplinary context and that learning is indeed occurring across our programs, our curricula, and our co-curricula. We need to start looking about how we integrate and how we add and contribute to learning even when it is not the explicit venue or purview of our particular discipline. And, and finally, that the faculty and educators uh, do indeed seem to have a, a foundation. They are the foundation uh, through which we're going to achieve higher quality for our students. They are the ones that are interacting with the students and guiding that learning and helping them make sense out of it. And so this is sort of a messy process that we are in. It's a sort of a messy, a multifaceted approach that controls for little and invites that 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 imperfection and that messiness into the process. Um, because we follow a, a, a mantra of never let the perfect get in the way of the good. Because what we're finding is that this information, this approach, provides so much useful information for really rich conversations uh, that I think Brian will say more about. So, Brian, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Terry. Uh, it's, a, it's a great segue into what I'll focus on as one specific example of implementing and using value rubrics as you know as, as one example potentially of a general rubric at one institution for several purposes uh, as Danielle and Elise mentioned we are one instance of the learning outcomes assessment consortium and so I'll talk about what we've done at Queens over the, about the past five years in trying to use assessment both to improve learning across the institution but also to gather useful data specifically for course improvement and program improvement. Uh, this is work that's been done by a group of us at Queens. I've listed three others who were particularly key in what we did. Uh, Jill Scott, our vice provost, um, was, was co-lead of the, of the project. Uh, Natalie Semper and Jay Kopp are both part of this, and I'll present work that all four of them had done. If we're going to try to yield useful information about what's happening in courses and programs uh, using value rubrics or adapted value rubrics, uh, we do have to somehow connect what students do in a task with the dimensions on rubrics. Uh, if we were to simply take the value rubrics as written, uh, it becomes challenging for students to directly understand how they can demonstrate that performance on a particular activity. In order for them to have sufficient guidance, we often need to take some of those high-level descriptions and make it more specific to the assignment. That will then enable us to have what you see on the right side of the screen, uh, that we're using authentic activities that will yield data that can be traced down to a specific uh, assignment, that will yield reliable information that's useful for course and program improvement, and that people can have a common understanding about. That's overall what we're trying to achieve if we are doing some kind of a course-wide or program-wide assessment activity. So what is often done, and one thing that we did as well, is to take a general rubric and take some of those high-level descriptions, as you see in this case, an example from something from Milestone 3 on a value rubric uh, with the, the text description you see there, and turn it into something that is much more specific both to a discipline and to a particular course and to a particular assignment. So we're connecting a generic rubric down to a particular assignment level rubric. Uh, we 
generally and usually feel strongly that it's important for students to see that rubric when they're working on that activity. It enables them to understand what we're looking for. So on the bottom, you see two examples of how we've interpreted that general statement in the black box in the middle of your screen in two different disciplines and two different courses, two different assignments. The engineering design uh, was one from my first year engineering design course, and I used the general principles from the value rubric descriptor, but interpreted that in light of what I was looking for on that particular assignment. So I was looking for students on that engineering design activity to draw well-supported conclusions that meet the problem need. So the students had to describe the problem. It was in an engineering context. And they had to evaluate the validity and confidence of the model and the conclusions. Uh, so that was how I was interpreting that general statement in the black box in the middle in a specific context of engineering and of first-year engineering, introducing students to what engineering design is about, uh, but also to the particular assignment, where it was important that students could actually look at the validity of their model, the uncertainty. So if you're predicting something is going to happen, how certain are you? How strong are your conclusions because of evaluating potential uncertainty? So that's one example of turning it into a, a more uh, direct and connected description that students can interpret for the purpose of uh, working on the assignment. Once you've done that, you then can have what would initially be the value rubric, which you see on the left side of the screen kind of tucked in behind what's on the right side, which is an example of a rubric from another course at, that used this at Queen's, uh, where each of the dimensions on the value rubric is connected to something that's much more specific for the purpose of that course. And so there are um, items specifically lined up. Now, as we're doing this with multiple instructors, uh, it becomes important to have conversations between the instructor and usually someone who's had more experience doing this. Uh, we found some instructors may have done some rubrics, but the idea of having to align it, it really is helpful to have someone else involved who's had experience doing this. And so we would then have significant conversations about um, what the instructor was willing to, hoping to accomplish in their course, uh, what each task was about, and how they could demonstrate that clearly to their students. In order to do this, uh, one of our project team, Natalie Simpler, developed a tool. Uh, the acronym is BASICS, which stands for Building Assessment Scaffolds for Intellectual Cognitive Skills. Uh, and it was a tool that was to help instructors take the generic value rubrics and generate at least a first pass at a rubric that they could then use for a given assignment. Developing a rubric from scratch is a long activity. Uh, when I do a new assignment, it might take me six hours, for example, to make a really high quality one if I'm going to use it over and over again. And so something like this can potentially significantly decrease the amount of time required to put a rubric together and also provide some guidance. Uh, on the screen, you see the link to the tool. It's publicly available. Anyone can use it. Uh, we've had people use it at Queens and quite a few other institutions across the world. On the bottom of the screen, you see the link to a paper recently published on this basics tool, which describes some of the um, theoretical background behind it and also how it was applied. Also, just a, a few snippets of how that was used. So in the process, this is an example of how uh, the tool helps someone go from a generic value rubric to a core-specific one, uh, where they would start with knowing what their, their year group was, their topic, their course, and selecting the type of assignment they wanted to focus on. We were using, in this case, three of the value rubrics, critical thinking, creative thinking, and problem solving were three that uh, were focused on for this. The step two was then to define the topic, and so you'd figure out basically what the focus was for the assignment. It might be uh, 17th century Russian literature. It might be something to do with um, mechanical engineering, but there was a certain topic you were focusing on. And then third, you decide on which dimensions on that rubric you wanted to use for your particular course. Uh, in your course for a certain assignment, you might have a certain focus on both certain elements of creative thinking and certain elements of problem solving. So you could certainly, um, in your course, do a bit of mix and matching. But within each of these, you're focusing on a certain number of the dimensions on the value rubrics. Once you've got to that, uh, then you can select the assessment components within each of those. 
uh, the, the value rubric dimensions are fairly broad, and you can often unpack that and identify some more specific elements that are appropriate to your discipline and or to your specific task in your course. And then once you've done that, it generates uh, at least a first pass of the rubric that uses the information you've inputted, gives it to you in such a way that you can then modify. It is much quicker to modify a rubric than to simply start one from scratch. So that's an example of a tool that uh, that we use to, to work with instructors and try to streamline the process, make it a little bit easier for them. When we're doing this, a course will often not have the expectations that span the entire dimensions of that value, value rubric. Uh, those are meant to be high level, they are program level, and so a given course might not have a sufficient range of expectations to cover all four of those levels. And so uh, it's often, we often will simply select a few of the levels to put into the rubric. And the instructor, of course, can modify it as they see fit. Um, but often if you're teaching okay, a first-year course, you might have something, as Terry said, which is equivalent to a zero, where the student simply didn't demonstrate a particular um, dimension. Uh, and you might include something from what might be milestones two and three, um, where you're trying to push students to move uh, a bit higher than what you might have as, say, an average or a, a meets expectation, which in first year might, for example, be benchmark one. And so first year, second year, third year, um, you're, you can certainly pick the kinds of levels that you feel are appropriate for your task in your course. As an example of what we've done from this, so I've talked a little bit about some of the how uh, involving working with instructors, uh, the basics tool that Natalie built that certainly streamlined this and, and made it a bit more efficient for instructors. Once we've done that and we have some customized rubrics that can be aligned with the value of rubrics and that we can use uh, in assignments, we can then use data coming out of it for course improvement. So once you have a rubric, as long as you're recording scores for each dimension, you can then look at the data and try to draw conclusions about where students are weak. On the screen, you see some scores from uh, my first year course in the years 2013 to 2015. Uh, the citation for the paper is in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. And over time, we were able to measure student performance using a course-specific rubric, which certainly could be aligned with a value rubric, but at this point I'm simply focusing on the, the customized one for the course, uh, where you can look at which of these were students performing well. In this particular case, we were using an eight-level rubric. Uh, that was because it enabled us to have sufficient discretization uh, that it would kind of connect to a standard grading scheme and a program of kind of a, an A plus and an A and a B and things like that. Uh, using that kind of rubric, we could certainly align it back to the value again, but it gave us a little bit more flexibility for the purpose of connecting it to grading activity. But we could see where the students were doing well and where they were doing poorly. And so in 2013, if you look at the data, you can see students aren't doing so well in certain things, or at least as well as we would hope they could. And so we can put some effort into trying to improve it. And so in 2014, we changed some things. As you can see, there was quite a bit of scatter that year. We changed some things. We did some things that, in the end, we decided to revert. But the overall trend is that by using data, we were making modifications of the course. In a specific case, we were adding a bit more structure and scaffolding. And then by 2015, we were finding that students' overall performance was improving. So it was a way of using data to change the course to improve student learning. We can also do that at the um, program level. So if we can take these core specific rubrics that are aligned with the value rubric and take some of those activities that students have done outside the course, score them separately um, using train and calibrated scores, which we'll talk about in a second, we can then compare the performance of students in, say, the first year of a program with their performance in the fourth year of a program. So what you see here is the result of the four-year longitudinal study we had in at Queens uh, involving students in two different arts programs and in the engineering program, uh, where the red dot shows you the performance, the, mean, the median performance of the student in first year. The blue dot shows the median performance of the student in fourth year on each of the key dimensions for each of the three um, primary rubrics we use. 
So on the top of your screen, you see CTPS and WC. That stands for Critical Thinking, Problem Solving, and Written Communication. And so within each of those three rubrics, you can see the median student performance on each of the dimensions on the bottom of your screen. And overall, you can see that students are significantly improving overall, but you can see where they're improving more than others. So it again provides information at a program level to identify how students are improving. One of the key elements of this was that the more the instructor's assignment and their own rubric aligns with the overall value rubric, the better your information is going to be. Uh, so this shows a whole bunch of connections between the number of dimensions scored and the median score on, of the students. And overall, the more dimensions we align on the course assignment and the course rubric, the better students tend to fare. It provides structure for them to respond um, and to demonstrate their knowledge overall. One of the key points we identify is the importance of greater calibration. Uh, that it's really important if you're going to do this at a program level and take artifacts out of the course, have somebody outside score it so you can compare the first year to second year to third year to fourth year, for example. Um, having the graders calibrate it is really critical. On the screen, you see the scores before and after calibration. So the kind of cyan colored, colored ones were the um, percent agreement between multiple scores before calibration activity. Um, the pinkish ones show after. Uh, and so you can see significant improvement after there is a significant discussion between the raters about what they were looking for, carefully evaluating student work on the basis of what was shown on the rubric, and that leads to significantly improved um, agreement between the raters. So final points about key issue, issue, issues for implementing um, and adapting rubrics for the purpose of program improvement and course improvement and overall improving learning. Uh, the first is the importance of ensuring instructors see the using rubrics uh, as criterion reference. So you're, you're comparing student work to something you've described in your rubric as different from norm reference where your goal is usually to try to have a spread of grades that might fit a particular notion like a bell curve, for example, um, where you're often trying to separate students. Out. And you know, for some purposes, uh, we do need to have a spread of grades. But for the purpose of this kind of activity, the primary focus is having clear descriptions that you think are appropriate on some kind of a scoring guide that allow you to compare student performance. Uh, second, training and calibration are key to be able to get reliable information. Uh, the third was it was is it's really important um, to support instructors in creating appropriate tasks that do align with this. Uh, and the fourth final point is um, the importance of being cautious about over-trusting initial results when it comes to using um, value rubric data at a program level. Um, a student might have, you know, 20 or 30 significant activities happening in, say, the first year of their program, and there can be significant differences in the degree to which they demonstrate those skills depending on how they felt in that week, um, who their teammates were, um, whether they were going to class that week. There's all kinds of potential variations. So to get a really rich understanding, it does help to have multiple assessment points per year. Uh, and so there have been some publications, I've cited the one at the bottom of the screen here, about the importance of if you're really trying to understand student learning over time using this approach, trying to have multiple tasks used and scored per year, uh, that provides us much more data. So that's, what, that's where I'll conclude with our uh, summary of what we've done at Queens. I'll turn it back over to uh, Danielle and Elise. Thank you so much, Brian and Terry, uh, for your excellent presentations. Um, we're now uh, opening the virtual floor to questions. Um, so we'll read out loud questions submitted through the chat box and uh, engage in a conversation with our, our panelists and participants. Um, I'll note that we may not get to every question, but we will aim to facilitate, you know, stimulating and enriching conversation. Um, Tyler, if you wouldn't mind passing the, pres the presenter privileges over to me, that'd be great. And uh, I'll start with our first question that came in. 
what's your thinking about part marks on rubrics? You mentioned that you had reduced from five to four quality levels for each rubric criterion. I was thinking of going the other way because my students often ask for part marks between rubric categories for criteria with larger grade values. So I think that was for Terry, that question. Um, okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll start at the beginning when we were developing our value rubrics uh, with the, the teams of folks around the country uh, in the U.S. It was... Um, it, it, we were looking at it from the standpoint of, of really a very broad, generic, as Brian said, standpoint or level uh, for the institution, for the program. And so for our purposes, um, we, when we do norming and calibrating, we, re, we ask um, folks to give whole numbers and not do parts so that that framing can be can be laid out, so you get some really, um, you know, solid kinds of, of positioning of levels of student quality work. What what Brian has talked about, we also at that time said, but we we see these as beta versions that we do indeed encourage institutions to take and to adapt to their mission, to their context, and so as folks have engaged with what. Brian, that process that Brian was describing, that's exactly what they've done. And often they have expanded the uh, range of scores that can be given for um, partial scoring and stuff like that. Uh, again, we have, we have maintained for the value standpoint, we want the whole numbers do not. So our, our calibrators, our normers, our folks that are scoring, we say don't we don't accept part scores. We want, a, we want a judgment made. But when you're talking about it in terms of the utility for faculty and programs and, and in classrooms, having that greater uh, granularity is where it is most useful and can be helpful. Um, as long as, again, you, you always stay in, keep in mind that a lot of things influence this in addition to what any particular faculty member does in a particular course in a particular assignment. So um, that's that's why we have stayed away from it because we are trying to deal in that kind of framing generic context. But we we are seeing and we we're seeing that folks have very good results from making it and refining it in a more granular way. Brian, is there anything you'd like to add on to that? Uh, I'll agree. Um, we also don't give part marks. Um, we, we're very careful with our graders to say that they can't give a 3.5, for example, as a score. It's got to fit within one of the boxes. Uh, the only difference is that for some of our rubrics, we actually give a range. So a particular um, descriptor um, might be in a box for which you can assign, say, either a a four or a five out of eight. And we do that simply because the boxes often have more than just, say, a few words in them. And so the students might do some of what's in the descriptor, but not all. And so we use that as a way of ensuring that when we give students grades, that they can't legitimately come and say, you know, I didn't do this one thing. Um, and as a result, I went from a 75% to a 50%. That's a massive shift in their grades. And so we're trying to have a compromise between the data we can obtain that does directly to a rubric, and on the other hand, be fair to students and not overly discretize their grade in the course. And this is Terry. I would just echo that point as well. That what we one of the other ways we've seen places handle this is by having um, in their scoring. A lot of the scoring is done digitally now, but but in the scoring process, to be able to do an annotation that indeed addresses what, what Brian's talking about, is that you know, A was there, but, but B and C was, were not there. And so they land on a box, a score, but there's an annotation as to what was there and, and what was not demonstrated in that piece of work. So the student uh, gets more precise, useful feedback. Our next question asks, can you speak to best practices in regards to adapting value rubrics for particular contexts in terms of process, faculty development, subsequent validation, et cetera? 
For instance, you mentioned greater calibration, but how do you recommend facilitating the calibration process? One of the things that we've done um, in large courses, so I'll focus on just a course specific to start, uh, in large courses, the greater calibration is done by first giving people a sample of the student work. So you give them two or three of students' um, artifacts, they score them independently. We then come into a meeting, which we often take you know, an hour and a half or two hours to do, and we look at everyone's scores. We go around the room. We ask people to support their scores, referencing specifically the description on the rubric they were using for initial scoring. And then over time, we work to get the group to basically agree we, we're always okay as long, as long as it's within one point. So as long as it's within this box or that box. We've never gotten to actually everyone totally agreeing, but within one point, essentially. Um, and by doing that, and then in, in large courses, sometimes doing a repeated calibration activity partway through the grading to see if people are shifting. Um, at the end of it, then we, off, we often would look at multiple scores, grades, and see if we're seeing some people whose median score or um, mean score is far above someone else's. Um, it's often quite a bit of activity to, to do some of that to bring things together. Um, at the program level, something similar. Um, it's really important, as I said, to focus on having a good discussion and making sure that uh, the person making the rubric has a clear description of what they want to their course to be about or their assignment to be about, uh, that uh, over time they're rethinking it, trying to make sure that rubrics are evolving over time as they find that students misinterpret them or graders misinterpret them, uh, and revising that as they go. Um, and to ensure that if you're doing program level assessment, that also there is an opportunity for the graders to have discussions among themselves. This has been one of the key pieces when we've done program-wide rubric scoring, is that the graders are actually having conversations about individual artifacts um, if they have a disagreement about the score to assign on a particular dimension. Um, that was a wonderful explication that I, would, I don't think I would add to. Um, that's exactly what we recommend, and it's, it's exactly what we did in terms of the development. And when we do norming calibrating, we follow a very similar process to that. Fabulous. Our next question, are value rubrics intended for undergraduate programs or only, or can they apply, be applied in other contexts? When we developed the value rubrics, uh, the, the focus really was on undergraduate education. Um, and again, because we had uh, educators from public and private as well as two-year, four-year institutions, including research at once, um, it, was, it was about undergraduate education. That's the primary mission of our association. However, what we have found, um, some, well, let me take a half step back. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the degree qualifications profile that the uh, Lumina Foundation uh, encouraged the development of that <clears throat> tried to look at the uh, learning outcomes and the development of those learning outcomes to higher order, more sophisticated levels through across the uh, undergraduate and the master's level, much like the, the work that had been done in Europe um, that really informed it and created the model for that. Uh, it, in the, on the whole, has not been taken um, to the doctoral level. But um, what we have found with the value rubrics is that many graduate programs have indeed taken them and adapted them and expanded them into utilization with the uh, master's and doctoral levels. I think um, the webinar that is going to follow this one uh, Lori Brandman, from, uh, Lori Dodge from Brandman University, they have utilized these rubrics for uh, looking at their graduate programs as well. And so we're finding that, and we're also finding the opposite in that we have uh, secondary educational programs that have approached us and have tried to see what it would translate into and what it would look like for students in particularly high school level, um, what we would call high school level. Uh, performance. Um, the college board that developed uh, AP and 
in their revision of their AP exams, in their AP courses, and their seminar work, uh, looked at the value rubrics and tried to develop uh, things that, that they could build into the development of those and the expectations for learning that would indeed be setting students up to be able to be more successful as they uh, moved into higher education, tertiary education. So it, our focus has been undergraduate, but we're finding uh, talented people, uh, taking them and, and expanding them both into ter secondary as well as into graduate education. So we've had some questions about reliability and validity. Is it necessary to test customized value rubrics for reliability and validity before implementing them? Is there an ideal sample size for program level or institutional level assessment? Um, well, I, uh, Brian, I think you can speak to, to what you have done around reliability and, and validity. Um, we, we do indeed spend a lot of time and we'll be having some information report coming out this summer that builds off of this three-year set of projects that we've been uh, doing. Um, but yes, I, I, what we're finding is uh, that the folks that are utilizing them, what we're finding in our own work and work that's being done by others, is that the rubrics do have validity on a multiple and various types of validity, um, and that the iterator reliability, there again, a, a, a range of measures that one can utilize there. They are not um, designed uh, as the st in terms of what the standard that was developed for iterator reliability, which were primarily developed off of uh, standardized testing, where so many of the variables were controlled for, and so that the measures that they were focused on for the learning changes uh, were were the ones that varied, and so they this measure of 80% agreement kinds of things tends to be there developed off of that. We indeed find that level of iterator reliability frequently, uh, in, but sometimes it is a little lower than that. But again, it's likely, and what we found is that it is a due to the fact that we're not controlling it. We're actually accepting student work from a multitude of different assignments and a multitude of different courses. and we're asking scorers to score it who don't even know the level of course, et cetera, or the, or the department that may have supplied it. And we're still getting um, iterator reliability scores that approximate that 80% agreement or, or meet it and surpass it. So I don't think every institution has to do great in-depth stuff, but if you have skeptics or you have critics, uh, you can always engage in that and see how it works. But uh, Brian, you know, has has indeed focused on that. And so I'll, I'll mention that, generally speaking, any kind of activity like this ends up being more reliable than what most instructors would do on their own anyway. So having the conversation with somebody who wasn't the instructor, who asks probing questions, um, who is giving a second set of eyes on a rubric, generally you'll tend to find um, that the rubric overall improved um, than what the course would have been beforehand. Uh, but absolutely, if you're trying to draw significant conclusions from data arising, validity and reliability are key. Um, one of, as Terry said, one of the weaknesses is that there are fewer factors controlled. Um, the strength, though, is that you're using authentic assessment where you don't have confounding factors like motivation, which you do tend to have if you're using standardized tests. Our LOAC study involved using both, and that was exactly the reason for it. We were looking at the strengths and weaknesses of different approaches. Um, and our studies actually were looking at correlations between student performance on the value rubric type um, scoring and a standardized test and student GPA. And we can see that GPA is often correlated more highly with the value rubric scores than the standardized tests were, often we think because of motivation issues. Uh, so. It certainly is a key issue, um, but I wouldn't say that one would need to do this before using it. Um, it certainly is an iterative process, and I think getting this kind of information, either, even at a course level, even the first year, often gives you enough to go on in combination with your gut feel about a course to action it 
Uh, at the program level, absolutely, it's important to be very careful with liability validity before making major wholesale changes. Right. Also, you mentioned you asked about uh, the question asked about the sample size or the number of artifacts. Um, again, our folks that, that deal with the kind of gen generalizability issues, et cetera. Uh, ultimately, it comes down to what are the questions you're trying to answer. And the more fine-grained and, and uh, granular those are, uh, the sampling frame has to be influenced by that, and you probably have to have more uh, artifacts collected. We, When we deal at this very broad general level for a program slash institution, um, we have been uh, collecting 100 artifacts on an outcome, and uh, again, our folks that, who are the the methodology uh, gurus that we work with say that's perfectly fine for being able to uh, have some confidence and ability to generalize from those findings. But again, it really comes down to what is the question you're trying to answer, and in particular as well, I think as Brian was saying. Uh, what are the stakes involved here? If it's a really, the more high stakes it is, the more you pay attention. I think it is important to pay to the number, the database upon which you're you're basing it, and therefore your sample may have to be expanded a bit. And on that note, we have to conclude our Q and A uh, session. Um, I'd like to express our sincere thanks to Brian and Terry for their time with us this afternoon, um, their terrific presentations and the Q&A. Um, we're very grateful to have had them on the call the webinar today. Um, and we'd like to invite you to save the date for our next webinar, which will take place on Thursday, May 17th, uh, same time, on Designing for Competence, American Case Studies and Competency-Based Education. And we'll have um, two wonderful panelists, Dr. Aaron Brower and Dr. Lori Dodge. Um, so stay tuned for a um, link for registration. Um, in the meantime, save the date and thank you again for your time this afternoon to our panelists, to our participants. Um, we will post the uh, recording from this webinar as well as the slides in the next couple of days and you'll receive an email. Um, and with that, we thank you. Have a great afternoon. Thank you all.